Hello again, everyone. This is a makeup lecture for my medical ethics course. This is material that due to an, uh, kind of an emergency situation, I wasn't able to get to in class. We did discuss physician-assisted suicide, but there was also this little complimentary essay uh, talking about active euthanasia that we didn't get to. So I'm gonna try to fill in that gap in you know, 20, 25 minutes here. So the article is titled, How to Argue Against Active Euthanasia. It's written by David Boonin. Unlike many authors that we have read this semester, Boonin is still around and still doing stuff. He is actually a professor of philosophy and chair um, at CU Boulder. As you can probably guess, the picture uh, is a recent thing I uh, procured from their webpage. Um, and the last time I saw him, which was a few years ago, uh, that seems pretty close to what he looks like. He has written about a ton of different issues in moral philosophy, basically all areas of moral philosophy, um, meta-ethics, normative theory, uh, various areas of applied ethics. This would be obviously a paper in medical ethics. He's done a lot of stuff, and, uh, and his work, in my experience, engaging with it is pretty high quality. I think this piece is pretty interesting. He's not actually an opponent of active euthanasia, as he kind of confesses on the first page of this essay. At least that was true when he originally wrote it. Obviously, it's been a while since this paper was published. His views could have changed, but at least what he says in the paper is he's not um, actually an opponent of active euthanasia. But he was forced as part of an event, because somebody pulled out of like a panel, he was forced to basically take on the role of playing devil's advocate against himself. So he had to defend, as part of uh, an event, a position against active euthanasia, even though that, that, that at the time at least, was, and, and again, he might still not really be an opponent of active euthanasia, who knows, but he was forced to defend the position that there was something wrong with active euthanasia. And this, this required him to think about, well, how would I construct the best argument against this kind of medical procedure or a policy endorsing it. This paper is sort of a refinement of the ideas that he generated as part of as part of uh, engaging in that activity on this on this panel. So what did he come up with? Well, before we get to that, quick refresher for those of you in the class, this is going to look very familiar. You've already seen this terminology, but just to set the background here, we've talked about three end of life procedures in this course in some capacity already. The main one we focused on is physician-assisted suicide. Passive euthanasia involves the removal of life-sustaining support, usually a feeding tube or a respirator from a patient. When you remove that life-sustaining support, it is foreseeable that the patient's condition will lead to their death. Active euthanasia is when, you, when a physician administers a lethal injection to a patient, which causes them to die, usually in short order. And physician-assisted suicide is a little bit different. It involves giving patient access to some kind of lethal medication that they can take to end their life. So typically the physician writes a prescription for some kind of substance that the patient can, can get. But it is up to the patient to actually take the medication. And based on the data we've got, there's a significant percentage of people who don't actually do that. Uh, something like 40% of people who request the medication never actually use it. This suggests to me that there's a significant portion of people who make these requests who aren't inclined to do it but want to have the option in case their condition was to really, really worsen. And because to get assisted suicide medication, um, at least in the U.S., in the states where it's legal, you've usually got to make two requests that are at least a couple of weeks apart so if, you, if your condition dramatically worsened really abruptly, you wouldn't be able to request the medication instantly, right? So you would need to have it on hand already if your condition worsened really, really badly and, and you wanted that option. Anyway, those three procedures, they all have some significant differences in the administration and what they involve, but they do all have the same outcome if they're followed right? They all lead to the patient dying sooner than they otherwise would. And they all involve at some level a for th this being a foreseeable outcome of what you do. Some people have argued 
that these procedures are so similar to one another that if one of them is permissible, all of them should be permissible. If one of them is impermissible, they should all be impermissible, right? In other words, you can't have a view that says passive euthanasia is okay, but active euthanasia is not, or that says, well, physician-assisted suicide and passive euthanasia are okay, but active euthanasia is not. You can't have mixed positions according, according to this idea. I think the most famous article uh, defending this kind of view is by James Rachel's um, it's just called active and passive euthanasia. The thesis of the article is basically there's really no moral difference between these two procedures. So that's just background that I want you to have in mind. I'm going to come back to it at the very, very end. So what does Boonin actually say? Well, how does he approach this issue? The beginning of his paper, Boonin distinguishes between two broad approaches to morality, modern approaches and ancient approaches. That's his terminology. What does he mean? By modern approaches, he identifies these three strands of moral thought, consequentialism, deontology, and contractarianism. We've talked a lot in this course about consequentialism and deontology already. If you're a consequentialist, you evaluate the morality of actions by looking at the outcomes and by, uh, in, at least on most views of consequentialism, trying to bring about the best possible outcome or at least if it's a satisficing view, an outcome that is good enough, that meets some kind of threshold. So you're looking at actions, you're figuring out what the probable outcomes of those actions are, and then you're trying to promote, promote good outcomes and avoid bad outcomes. Deontology is a usually involves a system of principles which are not just going to be reducible to bring about good outcomes. Uh, deontologists tend to care about things like individual rights, um, personal autonomy, um, fairness and other justice-oriented considerations, intentions and motives um, that underlie these kinds of principles. It's hard to class, it's harder to like put all of deontology into one simple box, but we did talk about the most famous deontologist in this course, Immanuel Kant, who tried to reduce all of morality to uh, one principle or idea of the categorical imperative. Of course, Kant had multiple versions of the categorical imperative that looked like they were very different from one another, though he said in his writings that they were all the same. Whatever, that's another that's a discussion for a different day. Point is, deontology, emphasis is on non-consequentialist principles, right? Usually a system of principles that takes account of a wide range of justice-oriented considerations. Now, Boonin suggests that contractarianism is different than either consequentialism and deontology. I'm curious about kind of what that, why he would classify them that way. I would view contractarianism as uh, probably just a subcategory of deontology. It's a non-consequentialist approach to um, moral and political philosophy where you essentially try to agree on principles by looking at what, um, by, by looking, by invoking the idea of a contract in some, in some, of some sort. Usually a contract that would be agreed upon by rational people making decisions about how society should be structured but under some idealized set of conditions. Probably the most famous variation of a contractarian approach, it might be labeled a contractualist approach by some folks now, is, uh, is John Rawls. Um, his political philosophy has been really influential. He's probably the most famous political philosopher from the 20th century. There's also T.M. Scanlon on the moral side of things, um, who has defended a sort of contractualist approach to morality. We haven't talked much in this course about that origin of, of morality, and Boonin doesn't, like, this is not a point of emphasis in Boonin's paper. I'm just flagging it, like, if you want to look up more about what that means, you know, you can track it down on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or something like that. But here's the point. All of these approaches, Boonin thinks, they do something similar in that they focus on trying to figure out exactly what, what actions or policies are permissible according to some complex set of considerations. He contrasts this with the ancient approach, which is basically virtue ethics, using the language of our course, at least that's what, it, what, what we would label it. Virtue ethics does not approach morality that way. It focuses more on character, it focuses more on questions about the types of people we want to be. And so Boonin thinks maybe 
this the ancient approach or virtue ethics provides more pro promising grounds for criticizing active euthanasia. So let's see how that goes. Here's the thesis, or at least the closest thing to the thesis that I think comes out of the paper. It's a statement of uh, Boonin's basic position. It comes from page 163. Even though society has the right to sanction the practice of active euthanasia, the sort of people we should strive to be are the sort of people who would refrain from exercising such a right. So in other words, this would be a way of saying, maybe according to other theoretical arguments and morality you could give, maybe it would be permissible to allow the practice of, it, of active euthanasia. But if we're considering what kinds of people we want to be, we still shouldn't do it. Now I'm going to, I should note one thing here. Let's go back to the previous slide. Boonin has four pages in this article where he talks about the arguments that have been lodged against the permissibility of active euthanasia from the perspective of these modern approaches to morality. And he thinks that those arguments have basically failed to show that there's anything wrong with active euthanasia. There's some overlap here with um, one of the assigned readings on physician-assisted suicide, which, which looked a lot at the consequentialist case against legalizing assisted suicide and all the worries that people had historically, and then looked at data mostly from Oregon um, in the United States to see if those worries had actually come to pass. And we discovered that well, empirically, it just looks like a lot of these concerns about abuses, about changing at people's attitudes toward dying, about um, the widespread use of the, of the medication, about the sort of slippery slope argument where this was going to cause people to now be okay with, you know, potentially legalizing euthanasia and, and later euthanizing patients against their will. That stuff just didn't seem to manifest. And there's also lots of data coming out of Switzerland, which has had physician assisted suicide for a very long time, um, but, but has never legalized active euthanasia that would also cast doubt on that kind of case. Um, Boonin addresses, you know, non-consequentialist arguments against physician-assisted suicide as well. Um, I'm not going to go over those. I'm just saying, like, you can read, you can look at pages 159 to 163 if you kind of want a summary of some of the historically significant arguments and his appraisal of whether or not they were successful or not. He thinks they were, again, he thinks they were all mostly uh, unsuccessful in showing that there was anything wrong with active euthanasia. So how does his argument actually proceed? It's got two main ingredients, two main parts. The first part is he tries to say, sanctioning active euthanasia involves endorsing a certain view about the value of life. And he says, in contrast, um, or excuse me, not in contrast, he says, however, we should not endorse that value of human, that view of human life. We should not, you should not be making those value judgments if we're trying to be virtuous people. So let's look at part one. Sanctioning active euthanasia involves a certain view about the value of life. How does he support this idea? Well, it involves two, comparing two cases. One is a passive, passive euthanasia case, one is an active euthanasia case. It involves Larry and Mo. Larry wants the passive euthanasia, Mo wants the active euthanasia. Um, the full details of these cases are on page, and his analysis on page 163. Here's the gist of it. He wants to say that when you are making a judgment to passively euthanize someone, this does not require endorsing a view that that person's life has no value. But when you are actively euthanizing someone, giving them a lethal injection, you would have to be endorsing a view about that person's um, quality of life. So let's unpack that a little more. Boonin says that pulling the plug on Larry disconnecting him from life-sustaining medical technology. If we do that, that doesn't necessarily mean we have concluded that Larry's life has no value. There, are, Boonin thinks there's two reasons for this. First, there isn't a positive moral obligation to keep Larry alive against his will. And that's essentially what you're doing if you have someone on life-sustaining medical support, right? And, and they don't want to live. You're keeping that person alive against their will in that kind of, in that kind of scenario. Boonin also mentions that medical resources are unlimited. And so if you have someone who does 
not want to be on a respirator or does not want to be taking up a hospital bed and connected up to a feeding tube and whatever else, um, and you have other people who are in need of those resources, that can be a justification for pulling the plug on that sort of person. But Mo's case, these Boonin thinks these explanations don't hold. You can't you cannot provide these reasons in that case. Because when you're giving Mo a lethal injection of morphine, um, you can't say that you're uh, removing him from some critical medical resource that other people want more and need more. That explanation doesn't make any sense. And this is not a case where you are just not going to keep him alive against his will, right? Because if you do nothing, like the difference is in the passive euthanasia case, if you do nothing, like if you simply don't provide the life-supporting medical technology, then the person dies, but it's not like they die as a, as a direct cause of your actions, right? But in Mo's case, they would clearly be dying as a direct result of your actions because you as the physician would be giving them the lethal injection that ended their lives. So you cannot, it's, it's not the case where you can just say like, well, Mo, I've got no positive moral obligation to keep you alive against your will. You're not the one keeping Mo alive because you're not, he's, he does not need in that kind of case um, a respirator or a feeding tube or some other critical piece of medical technology to just continue living. So you can't give that explanation to them. So then the question is, well, what, what's the rationale then? What's the attitude that supports the judgment that it's okay for me to euthanize uh, Mo? Boonin thinks that the answer is, well, you must conclude that Mo's life is not worth living. It's not a valuable life, something like that. So let's suppose that you get on board with um, with Boonin's proposal. Boonin thinks this is a mistake. He thinks that you shouldn't, like in the, in the active euthanasia case, that would be a mistake. You shouldn't endorse the view that Poe's life has no value. A couple of reasons for this. One is we live in a pluralistic society where ideally, if we're trying to be virtuous people, we would be tolerant of people whose life um, is different than ours and who value life differently than ourselves. So even if we don't, we wouldn't want to live in most state of existence, we should still recognize some people would, I shouldn't make hasty judgments about the different forms that life can take and the ways it can be valued. And additionally, if you endorse this view of human life, then you're sending a very negative message to people with Mo's condition who want to go on living. So sometimes our actions and policies that permit or prohibit those actions, sometimes they send messages. And one of the messages, if you're, if you're making a statement that like, people with condition X can can be actively euthanized by physicians. There seems to be an implicit judgment there that people with that particular condition have lives that are on balance substantially worse than people who lack that condition. So a person who has some kind of, and there are situations where this would seem very weird, right? If you imagine the conversations. So the person says like, uh, the patient might say something like, hey, listen, I have, you know, a progressing form of cancer. It's eventually going to be very, very painful and very bad. Um, I would like to be actively euthanized. And the physician says, well, how bad is, the, how exactly bad is the cancer? And they get into discussion, blah, blah, blah. And they say, yeah, for that condition, we could, we, we could give you a lethal injection. And then another patient comes up and he says, listen, I got the flu and it's really bad. And the person says, that's ridiculous. We would never euthanize you just for the flu. Don't be silly. Your life's not nearly as bad as this cancer patient's is. Now, I'm, it's a little bit too quick uh, as far as how that conversation was going, not very tactful, but you can understand how this could create some problems with how certain 
states of life are being evaluated and, and how that what that what perception that might create in society and what message it sends to people who have that kind of condition and don't think that their life is that bad. There's also going to be concerns here coming out of um, the way the way physician assisted suicide in the US is permissible is usually you have to have a terminal illness, you have to have less than six months to live, and you have to meet a wide range of other conditions related to your uh, a psychiatric evaluation and making multiple requests separated by um, at least 15 days, 30 days in some states. Um, and you also have to be like of appropriate age, blah, 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 right? But if we're thinking about the future, there could be circumstances where we start to consider things that, like permissibility of that procedure that applies to a wider range of conditions. If we're going to do that, this by the way is what's going on in some societies, right? So like Switzerland has a much more lax criteria for physician assisted suicide than that. The Netherlands and Belgium um, as well. There are other countries in the world that are not quite so strict uh, on who can request physician assisted suicide. If we're going to consider those kinds of ideas or those kinds of policies, one of the things we have to we should also consider is what messages does permitting physician assisted suicide for certain sets of conditions or permitting euthanasia for certain kinds of conditions, what might that be sending to people who live in those states of existence? And there are some concerns here about how what it might reflect about the value of people with um, serious illnesses or disabilities. Um, so I think Boonin is, is on to something here, right? There's something that is morally significant about these kinds of attitudes and about the character that they may represent. If we link these two observations together, right, this idea that active euthanasia requires us to endure certain values about the quality of life of the patient that's being euthanized, and we shouldn't endorse these value judgments, then we get a pretty straightforward case that there's something morally objectionable about active euthanasia. Now, what about some objections? Here's one that comes right out of the virtue ethical approach. Compassion for the suffering of others is an obvious virtue. It's a desirable character trait. So if you're a physician, seems like you shouldn't want to condemn people to unnecessary suffering. And so if you euthanized someone to alleviate their suffering, provided that that is what they wanted, maybe this looks like it would be an exercise of compassion. What does Boonin say about this? First, he says, there are circumstances where the right thing to do is not the act that produces the best balance of pleasure over pain. So, um, if you're, you know, if you're a strict act consequentialist, you might take issue with that response. But if you're approaching things through this virtue ethical lens, then you're sort of de facto non-consequentialist, right? So that's one possible response is just say, hey, sometimes it's not all about alleviating suffering or promoting the best overall consequence. There's other things to consider. The other thing he points out though is that not euthanizing someone is not the same as forcing them to suffer unnecessarily, right? It's not like the the physician is actively preventing them from ending their own lives. If nothing else, they would still have the option of refusing food and fluids, which is maybe not as swift a way to die as a lethal injection, but they, you know, it would be a way for them to ha hasten their, uh, their end without having to suffer unnecessarily. So um, not giving someone a lethal injection is not the same as forcing them to survive uh, in, a, in, a, in a state of suffering for some indeterminate period of time. Here's another objection. There might be some conditions so horrific that no one in that condition would believe that life was worth living. And the example that Bonin uses is uh, someone who has a really, really, really uh, severe, um, suffered a really, really severe burn of some kind and is in such, has, there's so much nerve damage and they're in such pain that no reasonable person could say that's, that's a state of living that is, that is worth it. He says a couple of things about this too. One is he says, maybe the virtuous person would just refrain in general from making these kinds of quality of life judgments. 
I'll admit I'm not totally sold on that. I, I think that's a pretty tough sell to just be agnostic about um, all of these kinds of judgments seems, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's necessarily virtuous. That almost seems like a kind of feigned ignorance to me. But his second response is maybe a little better. He says, maybe there would be individual instances where a virtuous person would condone euthanasia or mercy killing, um, even though they wouldn't condone a policy permitting it. This is similar to a move that is made in the debate on capital punishment. So one of the things that defenders of the death penalty will mention is, hey, you know, here's an example of a heinous serial killer who surely uh, deserves the death penalty if, if, if there are any individuals who ever do. I mean, what would you what would you say if you had lost, you know, a loved one or something like that to a serial killer who is now, you know, facing, you know, a, a penalty for their actions? What would you support? And some people have said, well, for me individually, I would surely in that situation want that person to be executed or want that person to be killed. But um, there can be individual instances where the death penalty is justifiable. That does not necessarily mean that a policy supporting the use of the death penalty is the right overall social policy, because there are other things beyond, you know, that, that, that need to be taken into consideration. So you might be making this, the, the virtuous person can make the same move here and say like, yeah, look, there could be some states of existence that are really, really bad, where life really, really wouldn't be worth living. But those are not circumstances around which we should design our policy. We should design our policy uh, in a way that, such that we're leaving it open. What kinds of conditions might meet that criteria and which ones wouldn't? We're not going to make a judgment about that in the, social, in the social context. Because making those kinds of judgments, again, would send such negative messages to people who have those conditions, who want to continue living, right? I think that's an interesting move. Um, and like I said, there's other there are other social contexts where similar moves can be made, right? To explain why there might be a discrepancy bes between, say, our intuitions about an individual case and what the actual correct social policy should be. Now, what's the connection to assisted suicide? This is the thing I said I was going to come back to at the little beginning of this spiel. Boonin doesn't talk about assisted suicide in his article. Um, it's just about passive and active euthanasia. But maybe his argument could be applied to assisted suicide in a way to, that would carve out a morally relevant difference between the two. So in the case of active euthanasia, Maybe we agree with Boonin that there's got to be some value judgment being made about the patient's quality of life. But maybe that's not true in the case of physician-assisted suicide. Maybe in the case of physician-assisted suicide, the physician could say something like this. Listen, Mo, I understand your, you think that your life is not worth living. And I respect your autonomy as a patient. I want you to feel free to make the proper decisions by your own lights about how your life should end. So I'm going to write you this prescription for assisted suicide medication. But I really hope you don't take it because I still think your life may be worth living. Or at least I don't think I can say definitively that your life's not worth living. You can't really say that if you're actively euthanizing the person right? You can't give that sort of explanation to the patient. You can't say, I'm going to respect your autonomy and give you the means to act on your desire to end your own life while also discouraging the patient from doing that. You cannot make that combination of statements if you're actively euthanizing the person, because if you're actively euthanizing the person, you're taking the action that ends their, that ends their life. So you can't be like injecting somebody and being like, you know, and, and like as the dose of morphine or whatever goes in their bloodstream, be saying things like, you know, I really hope that you come to, you know, make a different decision about this because I really think your life has a lot of value as the <laughs> as the morphine starts to sedate them. Um, you cannot that that's that doesn't see that's not coherent, right? Not a coherent set of statements to make. 
but you could say something like that as a physician in the case of physician assisted suicide and maybe it just comes down to the idea that you know you you respect patient autonomy you know, you're appealing that principle of biomedical ethics that we respect patient autonomy even recognizing there are situations where um, patients whom the physician thinks or at least is open to having lives worth living that those patients may still request physician assisted suicide under those circumstances there are perhaps some details to be worked out here but i think it's interesting to consider how um how our attitudes about people's quality of life may make a difference a significant moral difference in how we evaluate the moral permissibility of passive euthanasia active euthanasia and assisted suicide it's a very different take um, on on approaching policy than what we've seen a lot of other readings in this class so anyway that was boonan how to argue against active euthanasia um, if i run into him at another conference i may ask him if uh, if his position on on this has has changed at all it has been it has been like 20 years since he originally wrote this paper and published it so i'd be curious if he still if he you know if his attitudes about these procedures changed at all but i don't know right off hand uh, what his current what his current view is so i'll see you all next time um, i'm hoping this is the last makeup lecture i have to do for this semester though but it was a crazy october <laughs>